Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And everybody said amen. Shake hands with somebody before you're seated. Tell them it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. What a difference the line can make. Lesson seven. I want to begin uh, teaching tonight on the subject of men and women's hair. Men and women's hair from a biblical perspective. And uh, we're going to be focusing, uh, obviously, on 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And uh, this is writing, uh, of course, by the Apostle Paul. And uh, I want to begin, just kind of give an introduction here. The Apostle Paul, as you know, was a master preacher. He was a master teacher. And uh, the Apostle Paul had so many talents, so many abilities that, that flowed through his writing, his teaching, his preaching. Um, in Acts twenty one thirty seven, it says that he spoke the Greek language, which was pretty uh, common, of course, for that day. Uh, Acts 21 and 40, he was fluent, of course, in Hebrew as a Jew. Um, He was a Jew of the city of Tarsus um, from Cilicia in Acts 21 and 40. The Bible says he was a freeborn Roman. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees and a disciple of Gamaliel. There's a lot that went into uh, the Apostle Paul's uh, resume. And so because of all these different things, Paul was the uniquely positioned apostle who could write eloquently to Greek readers, and yet at the same time, in Acts 28, he could deal with and have a revival with the barbarians. That's what they were called. Um, Paul could write, if he did write the book of Hebrews, and I I think he did, uh, he could write a book of Hebrews, a book specifically to the Jews and, and take the Old Testament, eat it up and put it in a New Testament perspective. And yet at the same time, the Apostle Paul could write the book of Romans, a book uh, that did the same things, but more uh, to the, the uh, Gentiles. And uh, it was because of Paul's complicated background that he could take a complicated subject like uh, the relationship between the Old Testament, the New Testament, between law and grace, and Paul was used to, uh, to bridge that gap as, as God directed him in his writings in the New Testament. Paul was a fascinating man. He was an incredible teacher. You read in Acts chapter number 17, he gives a masterpiece, absolute uh, masterpiece uh, in Athens at a place called Mars Hill. It was, it was the... Um, the, the center of the world for its day, the center of uh, sophistication. It would be like kind of like um, New York City, Hollywood, London, Paris, all wrapped into one. And Paul jumps in the middle of a place like that, goes to Mars Hill, and he begins to preach a message to, uh, to the people that were there, the philosophers that were there, those that were uh, always interested, the Bible said, in a new thing. And, and as you read his message, it is, it's a masterpiece. He owned those people. He, he began by talking about how religious they were. And instantly, you know, they, everybody likes to know that somebody else thinks they're religious. And so they kind of perk up. And, and uh, then, he, then he uses their false gods to teach the one true God. He, he, uh, Paul even quotes their poets. There was a guy named Aratus um, who who made the statement for in him, we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said. He's quoting from their their Greek poets. And Paul quotes the Old Testament. He puts it all together in this masterpiece in Acts chapter 17. I don't think that the apostle Peter could have preached like Paul did in Acts 17 because of the background and where God uh, had brought him from. I would, and, and the reason I say all that is 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 
is a, is a teaching on men and women's hair by the Apostle Paul. And in this, this, this presentation, in this writing from verses 1 through about verse 16, uh, Paul uses every, uh, every argument at his disposal. He brings it all together to show the, the power and the importance and the, the significance of this teaching on men and women's hair. When I first introduced it, if, you've, if you're not familiar with this, you might be like, what in the world are we, what are we talking about? Are you going to show us how to comb our hair or something? I mean, what is this? But Paul takes a subject like this and he uses all of his background to show that, that this subject transcends culture. It is a spiritual thing. It is for, and we'll see this by the end of this lesson, that, that this lesson on men and women's hair uh, applies to everybody. everybody uh, it applies to everybody. It applies to people everywhere. And it applies to people for all time. And uh, when we're done with this, we'll see that this is not a cultural thing. It's not a Corinthian church thing. It's not a local uh, kind of ordinance or tradition thing. But Paul makes it so clear that this doctrine is a Bible do- doctrine with incredible uh, significance and implications. It, 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 it applies to the ap- apostolic church in a powerful way. And, uh, and, and he uses, and I want to show you this, at least a sevenfold or seven point uh, teaching presentation to teach on men and women's hair in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And everybody said, Amen. And these are the seven points that we're going to cover tonight. I will, some of them I'm going to go really quick. Others I'll, I'll spend a little more time on, but we'll be done right around 9 o'clock. So, and these are the seven points. Let me give them to you up front. First of all, the seven points to the Pauline teaching on hair is number one, we are to do this, we are to obey this because we are to follow Paul as he followed Christ. Number two, Paul presents we are to do this because of the ordinances. Everybody say ordinances. We are to do this, number three, because of the word of what the word of God teaches. Everybody say the Bible. Number four, because of the headship of Christ. Everybody say headship. Number five, we are to do this because of the witness of nature. Everybody say nature. Number six, one of the most interesting, a little bit strange, we're to do this because of the angels. Everybody say angels. And number seven, because of the custom of the church. The Apostle Paul, this this man that was a Jew, a Gentile, a Roman, all of it wrapped into one, educated to the nth degree, but most importantly, anointed of God, pulls out all the stops and uses everything at his disposal to teach on this subject in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and to point out, and this is what I want, the number one thing I want you to catch is this applies to us today. Amen. And so let's go through these, these seven points of Paul's teaching on men and women's hair. First of all, we want to talk on this subject that, that, that Paul says in verse number 1, as we read tonight. He said in 1 Corinthians 1, 11 verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of, of Christ. He is asking the Corinth, uh, the church at Corinth, the Corinthians, to follow him as he followed Christ. Now that word followers there uh, is, is a word that, that in the Greek you kind of recognize it's mimetes, it kind of like imitate, that's where it comes from, mimic, imitator. Paul is saying, imitate me, mimic me as I follow Jesus Christ. Now, I, 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 don't, I can't help but, th- when I read this verse today, I was thinking about, and again, I don't mean to uh, impose pain, but I remember Brother Rufino at, at the beautiful funeral of our, our brother Saul. And he talked about this verse that says, Be ye followers of me as I am also of Christ. He was talking about the impact Brother Saul Flores had on their family. And he made this statement. He said, brother, he said My brother Saul followed Christ, and I just followed my brother. Isn't that awesome? Thank God Saul followed Christ. And uh, I'm going to tell you, there's a principle there. Find somebody that's following Jesus and follow them, and you're probably going to be all right. Can you say amen? 
And so Paul says, I'm following Jesus. Why don't you follow me? In fact, in Acts 20, Brother Adam, if you've, you've got the, this verse in Acts chapter 20, verse number 20, and then we're going to read verses 26 and 27, Paul makes it very clear that he was interested in giving the church everything they needed, uh, everything they needed to be successful in living from God that he had received from Jesus Christ. Verse number 20 of Acts 20, Brother Adam. And how I kept back nothing... That was profitable unto you. Paul is, it's a, it's, this is a poignant passage in Acts 20. Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. Uh, in Acts 19, the disciples of John and so on, he's still in Ephesus. He's telling them goodbye. And he's, he's, he's gathered the elders on the beach. And to some of you that, uh, Brother Scotty Blair, the Bouses, my dad, you, you probably remember being uh, at, at the place that they say, uh, Paul was telling the Ephesian elders goodbye. And really, where we were at, the water was like, I think, a mile away now and uh, because the, the coastline had changed. But, but I remember standing there kind of imagining Paul telling these elders goodbye. And in that, he says, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But have showed you. I have showed you. And have taught you publicly. I've taught you publicly. And from house to house. And from house to house. I have kept back nothing that you needed in order to be everything that God wants you to be. Verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day. Paul is telling these elders, listen guys, I am taking you to record today. That I am pure from the blood of all men. What a statement. I am pure from the blood of all men. There is nobody's blood on my hands. I have given you everything that I needed to give you. Verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you. I have not shunned. I have not neglected to declare unto you. All the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. I'm going to tell you, that's a testimony this pastor wants to have at the end of the day. I want to be able to look you in the eye and look God in the eye and say, listen, I am pure from the blood of all men. I've given everything that God wanted me to give. I've not, I've, there's been no doctrine in the Bible that I hid from, nothing I ran from. I believe it's the will of God for us to have everything in the word delivered according to the word. And Paul said, I've done it. I've preached it. And you have a responsibility now. As I have followed Christ, you need to follow me. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's my desire. I believe that's our desire. I want to follow the Apostle Paul and his teaching as he followed Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And so, we want to be followers of Paul. Now, only as he follows Christ, that is. Number two, Paul uses this, this, this argument here in verse number two of chapter number 11. And we're not going to spend much time on either of the first two. I really want to get to the word of God, uh, the, the portion where he, I want to get to the actual text of 1 Corinthians 11. But Paul makes an interesting uh, statement in 1 Corinthians 11 and 2. He says, I praise you, brethren. Corinth, I'm happy for you. Because you remember me in all things and you keep the ordinances. Everybody say ordinances. As I deliver them to you. This word ordinances, it's, it's a, a paradosis. That's the Greek word that basically means traditions. It's traditions that have, of teaching or commandments that have been handed down. And this very likely is, is referring to uh, earlier writings of Paul or, of course, this epistle 1 Corinthians that he's writing. Very likely, the ordinances here is referring to the two following main subjects he's about to cover in 1 Corinthians 11. Number one is hair, men and women's hair. And number two is the ordinance of communion. Paul is saying, remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. I want to tell you, church, these were and are to be kept. Now, I understand there are traditions that are not of God. There are traditions. The Bible says in Mark 7 and 8, it refers to traditions of men that people keep instead of the commandments of God. And uh, I'm not interested in traditions of men. But I am very much interested in traditions that come from God. And I'm going to tell you, not all traditions are bad. In fact, Brother Gavin, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren... 
Stand fast. Paul says, brethren, stand fast. Anybody interested in standing fast? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be moving all over the place. I want to be where God wants me to be. Stand fast. And hold the traditions. Hold the traditions. Which ye have been taught. Which ye have been taught. Whether by word. Whether by word, if I, if I spoke it to you. Or our epistle. Or if it was something that I wrote down. Paul is saying, guys, there are traditions that have been handed to you. Things that you have done month in and month out. Some traditions that maybe even your parents did. Maybe your grandparents did. You need to keep on holding on to them. I want to tell you, there's an attitude out there that says, well, if, it, you know, if, if it's just a tradition, I'm not interested in it. If it's something that we've done for a long time, I'm looking for a new thing. I'm going to tell you, I don't want traditions of men. But if it's a tradition that has been passed down and, and, and it is from God himself, I want to maintain traditions that come from God. I'll tell you further, and this is not my subject, but there may be some traditions that are traditions that you literally are pulling out the fabric of the church when you begin to mess with them. There, I've seen some churches that... And I, I want to be careful how I deliver this, but, but taught something that I didn't necessarily believe in. It wasn't, necessar- it wasn't bad. They maybe had a stronger standard or, or something, uh, but they taught something I didn't necessarily believe in. Well, I, I've been asked before, should I change that? I, and I, I, would, I would tell them, no, not necessarily. You're, when you begin to pull things out, and this is not unbiblical stuff. I'm just saying it was a standard they had, a tradition they had. When you begin to pull out, it's like a, a, a rug, if you ever, you know, or a piece of fabric. As a, as a child, I, there was just something fascinating. If you ever see a thread hanging out, you want to grab it. And, and you pull it, and wow, this is great. And, and before long, you've got this unraveled mess here. I, I, sometimes we don't understand what we're doing when we pull out threads. We don't understand the implications of, of the thread we're pulling out. I want to hold the traditions that I have been taught. And thank God we've been taught some God-given traditions. Some that came by word and some that came by epistle. Anybody interested in holding the ordinances, keeping the ordinances that have been delivered unto us amen so paul says number one follow me as i follow christ number two keep the ordinances and i really believe that he's about to, among other things is referring to the next thing he's going to talk about hair and communion keep the ordinances and everybody said amen. amen number three this is the third thing that the apostle paul with his incredible background pulls in to say this is why you need to what you, he uses scripture obviously to back this doctrine, the witness of the word of God. Anybody thankful for the word of God? Now, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. If you, if you set your Bible down, open your Bible, and we're going to just kind of cruise back and forth around in this passage for a little while. Some of it I'll have Brother Adam read. Some of it I'll allude to myself. But I want to I talk to you about what Paul gives us in the scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 about men and women's hair. Brother Adam, 1 Corinthians 11, I'd like you to begin reading with verse number 3. But but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Everybody say the head of the man man. is Christ. Read on. And the head of the woman is the man. The head of the woman is the man. Read on. The head of Christ is God. And the head of Christ is God. And, and now, now, Paul, it's interesting, as he begins this conversation, he instantly gives it a context that is, that is you know, when I announce my subject tonight, men and women's hair, it's kind of like, that's kind of mundane. But Paul doesn't talk about it like, you know, we're going to talk about hair. Everybody get out your, your hairbrush and get out, you know, go get your hairspray or your mousse or whatever. Paul does not talk about it it's like some kind of mundane thing. This is how Paul talks about hair. Paul says... Let's talk about hair. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. He is referring to, and I'll get to this in a minute, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, the witness of headship. He's talking about how authority flows. It flows from God to Christ to the man to the woman. He says in verse number four, 
Brother Adam. Every man praying or prophesying. When he says, listen, man, when you pray or you prophesy. Having his head covered. You need to, if you have your head covered. Dishonoreth his head. What an interesting statement. If you cover your head when you're praying or prophesying, you're dishonoring your head. Verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. And then to the women, he says, but women, if you pray or prophesy. With her head uncovered. With your head uncovered. Dishonoreth her head. There's a dishonor that comes to your head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. It's all as if she were shaven. Now, what he's saying here, first of all, is that the man, when praying or prophesied, should not be covered. It is a dishonor to his head, which we see and shall, we read a minute ago, and we'll talk more about it, about it in a minute. His head is Christ. The man should not be covered. It dishonors his head. Number two, the woman should be covered or else it would dishonor her head, which we will see in a minute is the man or uh, the husband. Now, so there's a covering that is necessary here. There is a covering he's talking about. The man should not be covered. The woman should be covered. What is this covering? What, what is Paul talking about here? What is, everybody look at your neighbor and say, what is this covering? Now, this covering, there's a lot of different, and I, I, I had my brother look these up for me, and, and uh, most of them look like wedding veils, but... That's what we came up with. These are different veils, six different veils. And uh, some, I, there, and there's a bunch of different veils that you, you, more than this. The second one in the middle, the top, it's a little bitty thing on her head. The first one kind of covers a little bit. Bottom left, my left, your left, it's covering a lot. And finally, of course, the last one covers almost everything but the eyes. A question is, what covering is Paul talking about? Is it number one, two, three, four, five, or six, or some other? What is the covering? There are a multitude of types of head covering. Does it need to cover just part? Does it, what, does it cover the whole head? Does it cover everything or just parts of the head? There are lots of different types of head covering. Here's the answer. Immediately, Paul begins to speak about what the, what the covering is. Immediately after saying this in verse number five, he begins to talk about hair. He begins to talk about hair. Immediately saying the man should not be covered. The woman should be covered or else there's a dishonoring that goes on. He immediately talks about hair in verse number five. If you have your Bible, just kind of cruise with me. He says at the end of verse five, she dishonoreth her head for that is even all as if she were shaven. Everybody say shaven. Shaven. We're talking about hair, right? Talking about hair. Verse number 11. If the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Shorn, shaven, cut, haircut. We're talking about hair. Everybody say hair. Hair. Verse number 14. A question that I'm answering right now, I'm getting real basic, is what is the covering? What are we talking about here? Verse 14, Paul asks a question. Doth not even nature itself teach you? That if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. He's talking about hair. And the clearest of all this, the clearest verse of all this, there's a key verse in verse number 15. Everybody turn to verse number 15, but I will have it up on the screen right now. It says, if a woman have long hair, everybody say long hair. It is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering what's the covering for her hair is given her for a covering the subject that we're talking about here ultimately is dealing with the covering of hair and now which which covering is this again her hair is given her for a covering and it, who gave it God gave it. It is a God-given covering. I'm going to tell you tonight, when we begin to understand, and I know we're just now starting this, uh, this, this lesson, but when we begin to understand the implication and the significance of something as mundane 
as the hair on the top of your head will begin to understand that there's some powerful things being held in place when a man does get a haircut and a woman does not get a haircut there is power there the bible says there is glory there there is the angels pay attention nature is in sync when somebody gets the revelation that is discussed here amen it's not and and interesting it's not just hair But there is a specific type of hair that God gives for her glory and her covering. Now I want you to see this in verses 5 and 6. The words, and and, and in this chapter, and just just follow with me here. In this chapter, there are three words that are used to describe the hair uh, as as basically as a symbol of of something that, that God has set up. Those words are these. You ready? Shorn and shaven. And the next one is long, shorn and shaven and long. Now, shorn and shaven, these words indicate to shear or to shave the hair, just like they sound, and, uh, and, 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 and refers to hair being cut. We'll talk more about what that means. And, but the third word that is used in this passage is long, which while it does mean, it does mean long in the sense of like having tresses of hair, this word Really in this context, and this is very important, everybody listen up. In this context, this word here long means not shaven or not shorn. The word long means not cut, not trimmed, not pulled, not broken off, not shortened, not burned off. If you're here tonight and you wonder about this, maybe you've lived for God and you say, but my hair doesn't grow. I'm going to tell you, it, this verse is not talking about hair being a certain length. It's talking about hair not being cut. Interestingly, the word, the word long actually has this meaning. You can look it up in Thayer's. It's there. It means to let your hair grow. That's what long means. Let it grow. But it's only this long. Well, just let it grow. It only stays that long. Just don't cut it. Your hair is long. But, but your hair is long. Some people have naturally short hair. Just don't cut it. It is your glory. It is your covering. And as we will see, the Bible actually says there is power on your head because of the angels. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know I said it already, but I'm going to talk about it a lot tonight. If we understood the implications of some of this here, as we read through, we are holding some things in place. We are representing to nature, to angels, uh, to people around us, uh, the divine order that God is in control and God in Christ and man and woman. I'm going to tell you, there is power sitting on some of you ladies' head that you don't even realize. There is some authority that God has vested it in you amen and i don't want to get off on this too much but i think about you remember when moses hit the rock right the first time god said hit the rock he hit the rock water came out the second time god said speak to the rock instead moses hit the rock god got so mad water still came out but moses didn't even get to go into the land of canaan the reason was is moses broke the type and the metaphor Jesus was a was the rock. The Bible says that rock which followed them was Christ. And the Bible says that Christ once suffered for sins. We, he was smitten one time at Calvary. Now we just speak to him. He didn't have to be crucified of flesh. He didn't have to go back to Calvary every time you sinned. You don't have to get baptized again every time you make a mistake. You just say, Jesus, forgive me. And he'll wash your sins away. And Moses had no idea what he was doing when he hit the rock again. And some of us have no idea, women, when you put scissors to your hair. Or better yet, when you don't put scissors to your hair. The power that accrues to you as an apostolic child of God. Anybody thankful that I've been called by his name, that I can represent him? Amen. Amen. Brother Adam, 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 6. We want to continue with this. And I I do need to to move quick. I can see that already. For if the woman be not covered. If the woman be not covered. Let her also be shorn. Okay, if she doesn't have a covering, let her be shorn. But if she be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. Let her be covered. Now, obviously, there's an implication here. The implication is there's a shame associated with being shorn or shaven. Don't cut it, Paul says. There's a shame there. Don't shorten it. Don't burn it. 
Don't deliberately break it. Don't trim it. Just let it grow. There's a shame associated with that. Verse number, verse number seven, brother Adam. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Okay, this is the man now. For a man indeed ought not cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of God. Adam it was, the, was the first man, Adam. And, and men, we are in the image and glory of God. Verse number 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair if a man have long hair in other words if he does have this covering it is a shame unto him it is a shame there's a shame associated obviously there's a a shame associated with a man having long hair now i'm going to throw this in there this is but i my, my my brain works this way if if by saying for a woman if i trim it even if it's a little bit long it's no longer long just in case there's a man that would try to say my hair may be to my waist or my shoulders, or below my ears, or my collar, but it's not long. I have, I have trimmed it. you got to remember that the Greek word also for, for long hair also refers to having tresses of hair. It's not only referring to let it grow. So, Bible got you there too. The word shame here is a strong word. I want to just mention this quickly. It's not like shame, shame, you shouldn't have done that. It is a strong word. It's the same word you find in Romans chapter 1 verse 26 when Paul is talking about uh, moral sin, perversion, homosexuality, lesbianism. In this passage of Romans 1 and 26, Paul says that God, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. That word vile is the same word as the word shame. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, it's a strong word. Paul is saying, and I want to just summarize this third argument here of Paul. It is, it is uh, the, the argument of the scripture that number one, it is a shame for a woman to have her hair cut uh, because it is her glory. And it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, the word of God is very clear. 1 Corinthians 11 still stands in your Bible. We'll talk about it in a minute. This is not cultural. This is not local. This is not only for Corinth. We'll nail it down. You'll see it clearly. But this is something that applies today. I want to tell you, God wants us to understand the implications of a man cutting his hair and a woman having long hair. Can you say amen? amen. Now, the next, the next thing that Paul talks about is headship. And I am going, uh, this is in 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. As I read earlier, Paul says, I, the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Now, so you have God, Christ, man, and woman. This is the flow of authority or the flow of headship. Now, this is not a list in descending order of importance or something, right? You know, the lady's down here and the husband's up here. Uh, That's not what this is talking about. Uh, Even though obviously Christ is higher than every man, uh, every woman in every way. This is talking about how authority and anointing flows. And you can find this in, first, in, in Psalm 133 and 2. I'm just going to read it. Uh, but the Bible says, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his gar- garment. It's talking about the anointing of God that was put on the priest. It, flew, it, flowed, it flowed from the top of his head to his feet. It flowed from top to bottom. I'm going to tell you, there is a flow of anointing. And there is a flow of authority. If you want to be blessed, the answer is not to try to break the flow, to try to reverse the order, to somehow stay over here and hope it hits you. The answer is to jump in the middle and say, God, let the anointing hit me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm going to tell you, there is an authority that flows from God to Christ the man, the woman. It is the divine order that that is in Scripture. I don't have time to go through all of it, but, but... the Bible tells us the head of Christ is God. Jesus would often say, uh, I do always those things that please him. In his flesh. Jesus would say in Romans 14 and 10, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but the father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He's not speaking about the second person in, in a triune Godhead. He, he is not speaking about, uh, you know, two gods. He is talking about one God robed in flesh. And in his humanity, I obey, I do everything that my, that the, the father, uh, I, that I am, the father wants me to do. And in the same way, the head of the man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. And so Paul introduces this into a conversation about men and women's hair. And he says, 
that, that men, Christ is your head. And women, the man is your, your head. Your husband is your head. Now, I, I know this is counter to the world. I remember being in, in college. I was going to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Been going a little bit and sitting on the front row up in Arroyo Grande. And my dad began to teach one night. I think it was out of Ephesians 5 or something. Maybe it was this. And uh, he began to talk about th- this subject. And I remember sitting there and I was just wincing on the inside. Like, oh, I can't believe you just said the man is the head of the woman. Oh, Lord, help us. And then I began to realize he just read the Bible. He's not saying the man is better than the woman. He is saying there is a headship and an authority that flows. And, and, and I, I'm going to just tell you, no matter how unpopular or popular this may be, this is still God's plan, and it is important unto God. And when a man prays or prophesies, he dishonors his head if he does it when he is covered. And that head is Christ. He is dishonoring Jesus. And when a woman prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she is dishonoring her husband. But when the reverse is done, there was something powerful that happens. I want you to understand, Paul is not just talking about, uh, about hair in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a shallow way. This is something that applies to every church everywhere across the world. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So I, I want to I continue on. Next, Paul talks about the witness of nature. Everybody say nature. Now, this is interesting. And I, I, I'm going to do this quick, but you know the nature is pretty neat. And, and nature, embedded in nature, is all kinds of lessons about God, which only makes sense, right? The creation will reflect the creator. The Bible says in Psalm 19, the heavens declo- declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day it utter a speech. Every day the sky is talking. Every day the, the sun is talking. Every day, the Bible even says, every language in the world it speaks. The sun speaks Chinese, the the sun speaks Mandarin, the sun speaks Spanish, the sun speaks Portuguese and English and German. It speaks all of the, there's not one language where the glory of God is not being preached right now as I stand before you. The nature itself is proclaiming the glory of God. Then Paul says in Romans 1 verse 20, he says that even God, the existence of God and number two, that there's one God, his, his Godhead is proclaimed by nature. It's interesting that how did, how did the wise men know that there was a savior born. How did they get there? There was a, a star. Nature was screaming, hey guys, come over here. Woo! <laughs> There's a savior which is born, Jesus Christ the Lord. Right. There we go. Testing. Yeah, everybody say praise the Lord. Well, for a minute there, I thought nature was saying something. So nature does say stuff. It's like embedded in, the, in nature itself. When you go outside and look around, it's declaring, number one, the, there, there's a great God. Number one, there's only one God. And then finally, the fact that he wants to save us. Now, Paul taps into this. He says, nature wants to also tell you something about your hair. Verse number 14. I want to read that to you again. It says, doth not even nature, everybody say nature, itself teach you. Nature teaches you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. And then it says the word but. It it is continuing the argument and applying it to women. But, uh, and this applies in Greek as well, if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, nature is teaching. Now, I've heard people try to abuse this and say, well, let's think about nature. Well, there's a lion that has long hair, right? And that's the male. The male has the mane. And the, the, the female has a short hair. So nature is not, can I tell you, not everything in nature is, 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 is exactly what Paul is talking about here. You know, some animals eat their husband, right? The black widow eats. That's not what nature, that's not the nature you're supposed to follow. The nature that we're supposed to be listening to that's teaching us is that, that, that it's just kind of natural to us. I mean, if you're honest, naturally, you just kind of think, long hair, woman. Where'd that come from? That's not some kind of culture. That's been since man began. You think short hair. You think man. It's, 
Paul taps into this. I'm going to tell you, nature's getting changed a little bit. World's getting a little bit different. But I'm going to tell you, this is, this is still the principle of God. And embedded in nature is this principle. And listen, if it's not in your nature, Paul still says, this is the right nature. I, I have an article right here. I think Sister Sherry gave it to me. It, it's dealing with, I won't go into all of it, but there's a Barbary uh, that was sued. Uh, this is back in... Um, 2000, Wednesday, June 15th, 2016. There's a barber in Ontario. He had a, a lady come into his shop. And uh, she was a woman that had been, anyway, she's a transgender man. And he realized she was a woman and he would not give her a haircut. And, uh, and he was very kind. He said, ma'am, I, I, it has nothing to do with anything except I have a conviction against giving women haircuts. Well, she was very upset. She went. There, there's a, there's a, a group that's behind her that's trying to sue him. But he made this statement. He said, listen, I want to, I want to read to you what he, what he said. This man that had conviction, he, he basically begins to talk about, he said that, uh, I want to find this statement here. Bottom line is, he said, people go against what God has created. And when they do that, everything starts getting out of whack. He said, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. It speaks to her as her covering. And I don't want to be the one who is taking away from her her glory. Now, I'm going to tell you, we live in a world where, where the, it, it, this is, it, I mean, honestly, probably a lot of people that read this, what a, what a crazy barber. I'm going to tell you, though, at the end of the day, he's going according to the word of God. He's obeying what nature is teaching. And I want to tell you, I want to be obedient to what God wants to, to follow. I want to be obedient to the, to, to the uh, ordinances and to the scripture and to the witness of nature. Amen. A good question to ask is, did Jesus have long hair? Did Jesus have long hair? All right. Well, let's talk about it. If he did, then the apostle Paul was, was, was made a big mistake because he said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1, I saw Jesus. And he did. He was one of those post-resurrection sightings. Paul saw Jesus. And... Uh, the, 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 the confusion is, is that because Jesus was called a Nazarene, everybody say Nazarene. He must have worn long hair because of the Nazarites. Everybody say Nazarite. The diff, deal is Nazarite and Nazarene are totally different things. All right. The city, we have a city called Rialto here. There's a bridge in, in, in I think, Italy called the Rialto Bridge. They have nothing to do with each other. They just have nothing to do with each other. We, people have tried to make them related, but I don't even think the people that founded the city knew there was a bridge. And anyway, point is, Nazareth and Nazarite are different things. Jesus was born in Nazareth, therefore he was called a Nazarene. But the Nazarite vow was a vow that people would take. And basically, they would not cut their hair, they wouldn't eat or drink any fruit of the vine, they wouldn't touch anything that was dead. Uh, there were several different things, and they would do it for different lengths of time. And, uh, and because of this, they were called Nazarites. And some people thought, because Jesus was a Nazarene, that he was therefore uh, a Nazarite and had long hair. I, I have an article here, and I want to go through it quickly, but it's by Popular Mechanics. Popular Mechanics. There was a man that was a, an anthropologist, and uh, he was a forensic anthrop anthropologist. How interesting is that? Bottom line is he would take, uh, he, he would recreate what people looked like from a long time ago. And uh, he did it with... Um, Oh, I think Alexander the Great, different ones. He'd find skulls from that time and just kind of estimate what they look like. Well, he said, let's do that with Jesus. I wonder what Jesus looked like. And, uh, and he, he found three skulls from around that time and uh, got this basic look. But there were two, two key factors that could not be determined from the skull. First of all, Jesus' hair and the coloration. So this is straight from the article. It says, it was the Bible, however that re resolve the question of the length of Jesus' hair. Imagine that. <laughs> and uh, they, they, there's people that use the Shroud of Turin. Have you ever heard of that? It's supposed to have like an image of Jesus in it. And, uh, and the people, these are guys, they're just scientists. And they said, um, they said, how in the world would that be that Paul said he saw Jesus and then a few verses, a little bit later would say, it's a shame for somebody with long hair. Why would he say that about Jesus? And so these scientists, his name was Neve, uh, Neve, he said, for Neve and his team, the fact that the Bible said this settled the issue. 
I'd like to say that it settles the issue for me as well. If the Bible said it, then I don't believe that Jesus had long hair. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Obviously, Paul applies, a, 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 uh, he reaches for the subject of nature as an argument. This is not just a subject for the Corinthian church. This is much higher. Now, and I got I to gotta do this next one in the next five, ten minutes. Everybody still with me? Say amen. amen. Paul then talks about this interesting statement, the witness in the heavenlies. And he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Everybody say, because of the angels. What in the world is that about? Now, this is a pretty fantastic statement, but whatever it is, it immediately kind of elevates it. Is that fair to say? It's like, whoa, hair, (laughs) the angels, the woman has power in her head when she does this, when she doesn't cut her hair because of the angels. And whatever the full meaning of this verse, because of the angels, it's clearly indicating that this is something higher, something bigger. It is not just a Corinthian subject. And the woman has power on her head What's interesting to me is she has power because basically she has submitted. She has power. And and that's what I read one place. Paradoxically, the woman's sign of subordination is likewise her, her sign of authority. I'm just telling some women in this place tonight, when you obey the word of God and you leave the scissors out of your hair, there is a power and authority that accrues to you. There is an anointing that comes an anointing that's manifest when you pray but i believe just being and living life somebody that obeys the word of god in in the order that god has established it there is a power on your head now and this submission and consequent authority of the woman is somehow connected with the angels now what is that about well paul earlier in the, in the first corinthians has talked about um, how that the angels were interested in us they observe us and that we're going to judge them. In First Peter, Paul, uh, Peter says that the angels desire to look into the salvation that we have. And, uh, and we read in Second Peter 2 and 4 that he refers to the fall of the angels. Back with Lucifer, there was a fall that happened. There was rebellion that happened. Jude verses 6 and 7 talks about the angels that fell, that rebelled. And, and some feel, we don't know exactly what this phrase is talking about. But we got to do something with it. It just makes sense to me that this is referring to some of those those angels that had failed because of their rebellion. And basically now, the angels that have not fallen, they look at a woman that is in, that there's an order there. There is God, Christ, the man, the woman. A woman that has not cut her hair. And they realize there is power there. There is some authority there. And really, whatever else it means, I'm going to just tell you, it ought to make it clear in the life of every saint of God in this place uh, that when we obey God's words, big things are happening, even in the heavens. I believe that there are angels that look down. And when some of you have said, you know what? I'm taking a stand. I'm no longer going to cut my hair. I'm no longer going to trim it. I'm going to be a lady that obeys the word of God. I'm going to be a man that obeys. I'm going to trim and cut my hair. Get a, get a conservative haircut. That this is a testimony and something is happening in the heavenlies. Aren't you glad to be a part of something big? I mean, we're not talking about, you know, how to comb your hair. I mean, and maybe we should sometimes, but we're just talking about the power that God has vested in us in every area of life. Can you say amen? Now we're going to finish with this one because this is the final argument that Paul brings in the custom of the churches, the witness of the churches of God. I love this verse. You got your Bibles? Let's read verse 16. If any man seemed to be contentious, If anybody wants to argue, Paul says, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, I've heard some people want to make the argument that Paul is saying, well, if if somebody does want to argue this, then we don't have a custom. In other words, all that I just said doesn't matter. Can I tell you, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's not saying, everything I just said, forget it, because we don't want to argue. That's not what he's saying. The NIV on, on 1 Corinthians 11 and 16 makes it clear. If anybody wants to be contentious about this, if 
you meet anybody who wants to argue about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. We have no other practice. I'm going to tell you, there's no other way. Paul is saying, we just, this is how we do it. And this is beautiful to me. He says, neither the churches, everybody say churches. He is saying, Rome has the same custom. The Ephesians have the same custom. The churches of Galatia have the same custom. The churches of Judea, the church at Jerusalem, Laodicea, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, all of these churches, they have the, none of the churches have a different custom. I'm going to tell you, for those, and this is one of the biggest arguments you will hear against 1 Corinthians 11, is it was just for Corinth. It was just a cultural thing for that day. Paul says, guys, it's not that way. We don't have any other custom. Neither do any other, other churches of God. Listen, this is a kingdom of God thing. This is not some kind of Corinth deal. This is not a cultural deal. If you get nothing else, get this. This is a kingdom of God deal. We don't speak like everybody else speaks. We speak in tongues. We don't dress like everybody else dresses. We dress the way the Bible says to dress. We don't even do our hair the same way. We are the people and children of God. We're in a different kingdom. Amen. Another thing that nails this down, and I am finished. Musicians come. Is this teaching, and this is big. Listen, don't turn your brain off yet. This teaching is in the same chapter as what other big ordinance? What other big subject happens in 1 Corinthians 11? I heard it. It's communion. Communion is the other thing he talks about. And, and it's interesting that I've never heard anybody make a statement. Nobody advances the idea that communion was a cultural thing just for the Corinthian church. Why would they take their cherry picking? I'm going to tell you, they are for the churches of God. We take communion and men, we cut our hair. We take communion and women, you don't cut your hair. This is something that is a kingdom of God thing. And is anybody glad to be a part of the kingdom of God? 901, stand to your feet. Anybody glad to be a part of the kingdom of God? Anybody glad it's only 901? Anybody wish it was 859? Well, sorry. So, God gets Paul. He puts Greek in him, puts Hebrew in him. He sets him at the feet of Gamaliel as a child. He makes him, he's ready, he's a Pharisee. He's packed full so that when he comes to 1 Corinthians 11, he can bring it from every direction. He can come and say, follow me as I follow Christ. He can say, obey the ordinances. He can say, all right, if that didn't convince you, let's do because it's headship. If that's not good enough, here's the Bible, what it says. If that's not good enough, look at nature. If that doesn't work, hey, there's angels that are intently looking at this. And if that doesn't convince you, the custom of God... Paul pulls out all the stops. He throws everything at it. I read an article not too long ago. I read this to this church. There's a young lady. She was in the fall semester 2003 at the University of Houston. She was majoring in psychology, minor in theology. So she has this class and she gets there. She's an apostolic Pentecostal. The teacher gets up and he began to make fun of of Pentecostal stuff. He made a condescending comment about his, his wife's strict upbringing. He said his wife was raised in a pastor's home and, 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 he, and the class howled. He said she actually used to get out of going to gym because her dad would, she didn't believe in wearing pants and so her dad would write a note. So this young lady that was sitting in the class, she, she just, it troubled her. She said, next class, I'm going to say something. So, it was a theology class. Next class, the guy taught at the end of the class. For the first time ever, he said, does anybody have questions? And she's like, I have a question. More of a comment. And with a, a good spirit, she just said, in the last class, you, you told how your wife was not allowed to wear pants because of her unbelief. That, and the tone of your voice and so on, was, it kind of offended me. She said, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal. And my, my dad also used to write those notes asking that I not be forced to, to participate in certain activities because of the dress required. She said the class was deathly quiet. But she just kept talking. And I I just don't, I didn't really appreciate that. And the professor said, so you're telling me you don't don't do that? She said, no, I don't. He said, why? And she quoted Deuteronomy 22 and 5. 
and instructs believers not to confuse the genders by their dress. And she began to explain further. The professor got looked upset and he dismissed the class. And she just, another Pentecostal girl walked up and they talked. And so she, between that and the next class, you can imagine this girl did a lot of praying. She didn't know what he was going to do, what he was going to say. She went to the next class really nervous and she got there and the professor said everybody shut the door they shut the door and his opening words were I have an apology to make he said in the last class I was so shocked when this young lady said this I didn't know what to say I but I owe you an apology she said I I wouldn't remember what he said but my friend was taping it and so I with maybe with her phone or whatever and the professor began to say it takes courage courage to stand up for what you believe And today, class, I want to explain to you why she believes what she believes. And then he looked at this girl and said, I'm sorry, I I didn't know there were any of you left. Looking around the room, he said, my wife grew up believing like you do. As a matter of fact, so did my mother. And he began to tremble and his voice began to fill with emotion. I was nine years old when my family changed churches. And listen, if you're a guest here, I don't mean to offend. and I'm just teaching, preaching the word of the Lord. When we changed churches, the professor said the new church allowed women to wear makeup. And my mother had never put on any makeup. But because of the pressure of the other ladies, she thought she had to. And he said, I can remember watching her sitting at her table, looking in the mirror, putting on makeup. And it running as tears ran down her face. She was crying so hard. He said, I was a little boy. I didn't know what to do. She didn't want to wear it, but she felt the need to fit in. The professor paused for a moment trying to hold back his tears and he said, this girl here does not wear makeup because the Bible teaches that humans should not seek to alter their appearance. She also wears skirts. This is the professor because the Bible says for women not to wear that which pertains to a man. Nowhere in scripture does it speak of women wearing pants. She doesn't cut her hair because the Bible says that a woman's hair is her glory and it should be uncut. He looked at her for agreement and then, and then he continued She didn't even bring this up before, but she also believes that in order to be saved, you must repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus, be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. This girl believes in one God. She doesn't believe in a trinity, said the theology professor. And he said, you know how I know this? My family is all Pentecostal. I know everything she believes. This went on for about an hour, and then he dismissed the class. After class, she walked up and began to thank him, and he said, don't thank me. I was wrong. I... I admire you for standing up. Turns out he had a family member that was this young lady's dad who's a pastor, his mentor. They had this this relationship. The professor said it's a small world. And uh, for the rest of the, the, the semester, I'm almost done, the professor went out of his way to talk about Pentecost. Class was over. Next class, she... She was kind of disappointed because she wasn't going to have him. And, well, he shows up. The other guy got sick. And in the opening class, this professor was going to teach about um, the gift of tongues. And he looks over and he sees this young lady. He said, I was, I was going to talk about speaking in tongues, but we have a tongue talker here today. And she knows a lot more about it than I do. And for the next 45 minutes, this young lady got up and began to talk about Speaking in tongues is the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. Tongues and interpretation, the gift of tongues, renewing yourself in the Holy Ghost. I'm just here to tell somebody I'm glad that there's some truth that we can embrace. And there really are still some people that believe this way. What the reason we believe it? You know why? It's because the Bible says it. Because nature preaches it. The angels are looking into this. There's a million reasons why we believe this. And and I thank God. Listen, church, if we can get the significance of this, every time you look in the mirror and maybe your hair is really hard to comb and you're like, oh, God, maybe you're getting headaches because you got so much hair and and, and you go somewhere to get your hair washed or whatever, and they're trying to tell you just trim the dead ends. No, I'm not doing that. There is power on my head because of the angels. I'm going to tell you, you're holding some things together. Men, you're holding some things together. And I, I am going to open this altar. It's, it's just the thing to do. If you have to go, I understand. But here tonight, if there's somebody that would say, Lord Jesus, I love your word. And God, I know why I do what I do. 
I do it, God, because I want to follow Paul as he followed Christ. I do it, God, because of the ordinances. I'm coming to this altar, and I'm making a statement of faith that I do this because of the word of God. I do it because of the witness of headship. I do it because of the witness of nature. I do it because of the witness of the angels. I do it, God, because of all the promises in your word. I do it because distinction between the sexes, all of this, Lord, is in your book. If that's how you feel, won't you just lift your hands and talk to the Lord. Hallelujah.